Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 316th episode, we have some good news and bad news for Sauropod fans. Hmm, I like the sound of the good news. You have the good news, I have the bad news. Oh, that makes sense. (laughs) And then in our fun fact, we have some fantastic news for turtle fans. I'm not sure about this episode, Gary. (laughs) Do you see a trend in what I'm covering? I do. I'm not sure about this. Well, we also have an interview with Taylor McCoy, which covers tyrannosaurs, the Carnegie Museum, and a spot in Pennsylvania to go fossil hunting. Ooh, that's nice. Yeah, that's a, a happier note, maybe. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Xenoceratops. But as always, we want to thank some of our patrons. This week, we have a brand new patron, Jurassic Jim, which is a great name. And we've already had some good conversation, which is always enjoyable. And rounding out our 10 patrons that are getting shout outs this week are Blue Gollimer, Christine, Wurgersaurus, TRX Dinosaurs, Trev, Bradley, Melina and Manoli, Scotty, and Ricky. Yay, thank you so much. Your support is what keeps our show going, and we really appreciate it. And we really appreciate our growing community on Discord, too, which is one of the perks. So if you want to join, check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. It's getting more and more active all the time, which mm-hmm. I really enjoy. Mm-hmm. Jumping into the news, we're going to start with the bad news. Get that out of the way. It's not really bad news, but you'll see. Oh, did you see the picture that I put in the notes? I didn't. I remember this story. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Hey, we're learning more about sauropods. So that's something. Yeah, we didn't really learn anything specifically about the sauropod itself in this case, but we learned about what was inside the sauropod, which is not a sauropod, some other creatures. Parasites. Spe- yeah, blood parasites mm. specifically. So <laughs> this article was written by Tito Aureliano and others and published in Cretaceous Research and is published in February of 2021. Like many articles we talk about, they have a publication date in the future because they list their print publication date, not the online publication date. It always makes things a little bit confusing. Or maybe we just live in the future. It feels more and more like that all the time. So (laughs) this specific disease that the dinosaur was dealing with was another case of osteomyelitis in a dinosaur. We've talked a little bit about osteomyelitis before. It's literally a bone infection. I think the Latin also includes inflammation because I think itis, like hepatitis, is liver inflammation. So it's like a bone inflammation, which is really weird to think about. Hmm. And it is kind of a rare disease. It's not a common thing that happens. So every time it gets found, I think every case of this in the paleontological record gets published Mm -hmm. because it's always an exciting thing to publish on. And painful sounding. Yeah, it it sounds pretty unpleasant. It's the type of infection. It's not usually directly into the bone. Usually the way it happens is an infection starts somewhere else in the body and then it spreads to the bone through the blood, which is why it's considered like a bloodborne pathogen. Poor sauropod. Yeah. But I want to go through some of the other cases of osteomyelitis we've talked about before. So the first one I think we talked about was Spiclipius, also Mm. one of my favorite dinosaur names to say. Mm Mm-hmm. Spiclipius had a osteomyelitis in its left leg. Oh, yeah, I remember. Which obviously caused problems for the poor Spiclipius. Spiclipius. Also, (laughs) in 2016, we reported the first case in a sauropod. That one was in Argentina. And I think it was an unidentified titanosaur. I don't think they figured out what exactly it was. But it was in a series of vertebrae, not in a limb bone. And they described the texture as, quote, irregular microbubbly. End quote. What does that mean? Like bubbles in the bone. Oh, is how they no. describe it. Oh, ouch. Yeah, it doesn't sound good at all. It also had abscesses, erosion, and pits in the bone. So that sauropod was going through a tough time. Well, the art, the art looks really painful. Well, that's for this dinosaur, not for the one in 2016. Oh, yeah. Okay. But it would have been similar, right? Maybe. This one was in the vertebrae not in a limb bone, so I'm not sure Mm -hmm. what they think with regards to that. But we've also seen it in another sauropodomorph in Lufungosaurus. It had a big abscess in one of its ribs and in the toe bone of the ornithopod Tenontosaurus, which was the first Brody abscess we talked about at the time, which probably caused it to limp. Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, these osteomyelitis infections are really gnarly. And Probably led problems. to their deaths. It yeah, definitely doesn't help. Not like some of the other paleopathologies we talk about where it's like, oh, it, it healed, it broke a bone, but it healed and it probably lived its life with just a little bit of less mobility or something. Right. Some extra bone growth. You could tell when it was about to rain or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is definitely more serious than just rain sensing. <laughs> <laughs> so this new one was from a titanosaur in southeast Brazil. It's a partial fibula. So again, in a leg bone. And the outside of the bone appears lesioned, as they classify it. Or in other words, wounded looking. Oh, no. The bones from the late Cretaceous about 85 million years ago. The unique detail here is that they think they found the actual microorganisms that caused the osteomyelitis. Jacques. Yeah. The authors phrase it as, quote, this may be the earliest occurrence of infectious bone disease associated with parasites, mm. end quote. I knew there's something I didn't like about parasites. There's lots of things not to like about parasites. Yeah, this just <laughs> adds to it. True. So they did both CT scans and they took a histological slice of the bone to get a better look through optical and scanning electron microscopes. Unfortunately, they couldn't identify lags or an external fundamental system. They were all just gone by the infection. Well, what they actually think, I think that is part of it, but also when dinosaurs get really old, sometimes the bone gets what they call remodeled mm. and it's just like as it ages, it basically changes its form a little bit to get a little more sturdy or otherwise optimized for its situation. And because of that, it can eliminate the lags and the external fundamental system. And they think that's probably the case here. So it was probably very old. Okay, at least it lived a long life. Exactly. Oh, but hopefully it didn't have this infection for a long time. Probably not. They described it as acute osteomyelitis, mm. which to my understanding means that it was a pretty rapid onset. And they found three generations of overlapping secondary osteons in the bones, which I think... I don't know if those would have necessarily formed if there was osteomyelitis going on at the time, but it, it's another indication, at least, that it was likely an adult. Now, the bone remodeling, that happens even early on because we've talked about before with hatchling sauropods. And you, after just even a few months, you can start to see some bone remodeling happen. Yes, that's true. But in this case, with the secondary osteons type of remodeling, mm -hmm. that's associated with being older in age. And specifically, the way they put it is the individual probably, quote, had long ceased its growth at the moment of its death, end quote. Okay. They describe it as both senescent or senile. In medical terms, that basically means that its health may have been declining due to its advanced age. Well, that's interesting, too, because it's rare that we can look at a dinosaur and say, oh, we know it was done growing. Yeah. Well, I, and we can't necessarily say that we know that in this case mm. because we don't have the external fundamental system, but it's just their best guess based on the details we have. Right. But I do think that's a good point because with sauropods, we've talked about how, you know, they didn't have a lot of predators mm -hmm. and they probably just lived out until once they reached a certain size, nothing could touch them until they got injured or they just died of old age and then things might eat them. Mm -hmm. It seems like that might have been the case here where it was like in that untouchable <laughs> size range and it was just living to such an old age that eventually the parasites got to it. Oh, was that the fate of old dinosaurs? Yeah, it's, at least in this case, yes. <laughs> in this paper, they don't call it micro bubbly texture. They describe it as aero candy like. That sounds a little better. Have you ever had aero candy? No. I had to look it up. I think it's European based on the packaging. Oh, wait. Yes, I have had. And it, it is kind of bubbly looking. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong, but the picture I saw of it looks kind of like if you slice into it, it's like a lot of air pockets in chocolate. Yes. Oh, no. You've ruined aero candy for me. <laughs> I remember enjoying it. Now that's all I'll be able to think about when well, I eat it. It's not available here, so you're not missing out on much. You can get anything through the internet. But our, yeah, some of our listeners probably like Aero Candy. Sorry about that. But if you're wondering, now you, if you do know about Aero Candy, you have a good idea about what this bone looked like after the osteomyelitis got to it. Oh, I used to like Aero Candy. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You can still enjoy it. Just don't think about the sore pods. Maybe by the time I eat Aero Candy next, I'll have forgotten about this. That's true. So in this case, they didn't identify any bite marks or mechanical problems with the bone, 
which is a contrast to some of the other cases that we mentioned. Like I think the Spiclipius, or at least the toe on the ornithopod, seemed to have been maybe injured and then got infected. But in this case, it doesn't look like the original site of the infection was some kind of injury at that point, which again is that bloodborne most likely cause. The parasites just decided to dive in. Yeah, I mean, that's what they do. They also found multiple areas with the infection at different stages of development. And what they said was the bone gets spongier and less dense as the infection develops. So it's sort of like puffing out the bone and I don't know, maybe consuming the calcium or something. It's doing something living off the bone or maybe it's just living off the blood itself and Mm. just growing within the bone. I'm not sure, but it's causing big problems for this titanosaur for sure. Probably hurt to make any movements. Yeah, and I think that's why the paleo art shows it as basically just covered in these open wounds. It's really like gnarly. It almost looks like it's rabbit or something where it's just like falling apart. And yeah, it's very sad looking. Mm -hmm. I was actually surprised to see that because usually when we're talking about these bone pathologies, a lot of times it's like you might not see it from an external standpoint because it's just on the bone. But since this had advanced so far. Yeah. And there was lots of inflammation to go along with it and things that Mm. it just seems like, yeah, there were probably some major issues going on with the dinosaur. And it may have even been the cause of death. This also brought up a brand new piece of science that I had never heard of before, which is paleoparasitology. That's fun to say, (laughs) but probably terrible. Yeah, so parasites in the paleontological record, in other words, In order to closely look at the parasites, they took a slice, that histological slice of it, and then used an optical microscope to look really closely at it. And they found 64 dark gray to slightly green worm-like microorganisms in the bone. Yeah, it's pretty disturbing. They range from 10 to 80 micrometers in width, which is similar to a human hair, and from 100 to 650 micrometers in length, or about a tenth to a little over half a millimeter. So they're not too small. Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't see it with the naked eye, but it's... But uh, you'd feel them. (laughs) Well, I don't think you would if it was on your hand or anything. Um, Well, once they get in. Yes, if you have thousands of them in your bones, yeah, Mm -hmm. you would feel their effects for sure. They consider this size range really large for this type of infection. And to me, that made me just think like, do big animals get big parasites? Mm. And since sauropods were so big, did they just have larger versions of these or infections? does that go along with uh, animals were just a little bigger in the Mesozoic? Yeah, I don't know. Or I guess parasites aren't necessarily animals, but anyway. Yeah, I think they are. In other paleoparasitology, though, there was another individual called the paleoleishmania, I think is how it's pronounced. It was found in Burmese amber, which means that it was about 100 million years old or a little bit older than this dinosaur. And these individual worm thingies were 10 to 100 times the size of those. So even in the Mesozoic, these seem big for what they were. Hmm. Although if it was in Burmese amber, these other ones probably weren't in a sauropod because usually the kind of stuff you're finding in Burmese amber are smaller. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to say exactly. If you're wondering what they look like, they're more tapered on one end and they have a matching pair of spots that they could actually identify using the optical microscope. Not all of them had the spots. It's unclear if maybe they just didn't preserve in all the individuals, but they match in like size and orientation and stuff on the ones that have them. Because, you know, you need species identification even on the tiny scale. Yeah. The electron microscope also showed that the worms are denser than the surrounding bone, indicating that it probably isn't just like a weird feature of the bone. They couldn't identify what the parasite was. Their best guess is that it's a parasitic protozoan, like that paleoleishmania that I mentioned. But again, it's much bigger than most protozoans, except for, quote, certain amoeba-like organisms, end quote. Hmm. So... I expect another paper to come out soon where they're really digging into this paleoparasitology. Hopefully I don't miss it because it might not trigger all our dinosaur keyword Mm. (laughs) search results that we have. But hopefully we'll see what this is and maybe learn a little bit about what was inside the sauropod. Poor, poor sauropod. Yeah. One maybe upside is that it's technically possible that the worms got into the bone after the animal died and they were just eating the bone. 
but it does seem really unlikely since you can see this like spongy tissue develop and that kind of thing isn't going to happen after the animal dies. That happens to happen while it was alive, Mm -hmm. but it could have been caused by something else maybe. And then the worms managed to get in and enjoy themselves. Feast. Yeah. So unclear. All right. I'm going to think of it that way. Yeah. I feel bad for that sauropod though. It was a really rough story. Mm -hmm. Some rough endings for some dinosaurs. Is often how it goes. If there's no predator for you, the thing that takes you down is an infection or some microscopic thing that you can't defend yourself against. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of some of these crazy things in the food web where there's like this certain type of starfish that has all these poisonous spines on it and it's almost completely invulnerable to everything. It's ever the one thing that can eat it is like a shrimp because it can go around the spines and then it just picks away at it. Ooh, that's a rough way to go too. <laughs> yeah, there's always there's always something out there. Nature is like that. It, nothing is un- invulnerable. There'll be something that develops to Death take by advantage. a thousand cuts. Yeah, exactly. All right, we got happy <laughs> sauropod news next. So in China, there's a really cool mementosaurid as far as I know, no pathologies, that's waiting to be (laughs) excavated and named. And Boston University student Henry Liu discovered it last May. He was digging for dinosaurs with a team, and he found a bone on a dried-up riverbed, and he followed the trail up a small hill, and then there were more bones. So digging is currently on hold now due to COVID. But what's cool is this is the second time only that a mementosaur has been found in the badlands of Baiyan in China. And so far, the team's found mostly pelvic bones. Nice. That's a good way to start, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, Li Daqing, the lead paleontologist of the dig, and his team, they estimate the whole pelvis is about 5 feet or 1.5 meters. So Henry Liu, the student who found the Menchisaur, he studies marketing and advertising, <laughs> but it's a really cool story. He grew up in Singapore, and when he was 12, he and his family were on a private tour in a local museum, and on the tour, there were these two dinosaurs next to each other, and they looked really alike, except for the skulls. And he looked at them, and he realized that the name tags on them were switched. So he told the tour guide, and Li Daqing, who's the museum's chief scientist, overheard. So he started talking to Henry and then invited him to go on future excavations with him. And so Henry got to go to the Gobi Desert when he was 15. Oh, wow. And he spent every summer since high school excavating with this team. That's really cool. I know. So he's found so far a yet undescribed stegosaur from the Cretaceous. He's found theropod and ornithopod fossils a clutch of dinosaur eggs, and a new species of bowfin fish that lived around the time of dinosaurs. Wow, he's got a real eye for it. Mm Mm-hmm. I can see why they invited him along. (laughs) Yeah. You've got a knack for spotting subtle distinctions of dinosaur fossils. Let's put those eyes to use out in the field. (laughs) (laughs) That's really cool. I love mementosaurids and their ridiculously long necks. Mm Mm-hmm. I always think of that one animatronic one we saw in Japan. Yeah. Yeah, where it was mostly neck. Yeah, it was impressive how it moved. Yeah, yeah, very cool. All right, in other news, in Derby, Kansas, in the U.S., Field Station Dinosaurs in Derby is having a holly jolly Jurassic holiday event. (laughs) (laughs) That's a fun one to say. So from now until January 3rd, they have winter activities like ice skating. They've got all-weather sled runs. And in the evenings, they turn on holiday lights. And the parks open Wednesdays through Sundays for anyone in the area. And now on to our interview with Taylor McCoy. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because we interviewed him very early on, episode eight. Yes. And as always, I talk too much. And in this case, I can blame Taylor a little bit, too, because we both got going on the topic of dinosaurs. So I had to edit it down a little bit. But I, as usual, published the extended version as premium content for our patrons. So if you're a patron, check out the extended interview. That's how you know it's good. You got two really passionate people. Oh, yeah. We're joined this week by Taylor McCoy, and he is the creator of the excellent website, Everything Dinosaurs. He was also one of our very first interviews, and I think the first person we interviewed who's a fellow dinosaur enthusiast on the show, which is awesome. And he's written blog posts for us, like about T-Rex. He's also worked at the Carnegie Museum as a volunteer and, yeah all-around great dinosaur enthusiast. So thank you for coming back. Oh, thanks for having me back. I'm glad uh, I didn't, you know, ruin my chances after that first one. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we were talking a little bit about how we both cringe when we think about 
how much we've learned since our you know early days as dinosaur enthusiasts so yeah. yeah it's it's nice to be able to update things so since we were talking a little bit about everything dinosaurs last time you had about 151 dinosaurs on there do you know how many you're up to now on the site <laughs> So it's at 157 at this point. I was telling you a little bit before we started about how it's been a while since I really was on there seriously, you know, maintaining everything. So I haven't been updating it with too many new species for a while. I was kind of doing a little bit of an overhaul with things like the size comparisons or getting better quality images and Mm. maybe rewording some things or updating things if there was a new discovery. So I kind of took a break from adding new species and kind of just wanted to maintain what I had. But yeah, so we're at 157 now. I'm going to restart another overhaul because I never did even finish the last one. It sorely needs it. But yeah, 157. Some of those will probably go away because I still have things like nanotyrannus on there, which while technically speaking might not be wrong per se, it should probably be just lumped in with T-Rex at this point and some of the similar situations like that. And then I have whole groups of dinosaurs missing. I had I looked it over and I realized I didn't even have any overaptorids on there. Well, I appreciate that you're trying to keep it up to date because 150 accurate descriptions of dinosaurs is a lot better than 600 descriptions of dinosaurs that are massively out of date and What's the value in that anyway? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I try to keep it fairly brief because I know a lot of aspects of paleontology can be rather overwhelming. And, you know, even just an average Wikipedia page, while filled with good information overall, is sometimes exhausting to read through. So I try to just give keep it to a paragraph or so just to give a good generalization. You know, there's much better sources out there that I think for more in-depth researches would be good. But it kind of as a starting point is kind of how I view this website is that, okay, I read a paragraph about this dinosaur on this website. I want to know a lot more. And then you can go do some supplementary research more specifically. Nice. Yeah, that sounds like a good way to start. And I know with you, you've written some T-Rex stuff on our site. So I could imagine your T-Rex page getting a lot longer. Yeah, it's... Out of all the ones on there, it's the one that I have the largest paragraph on because I have to, I'm trying to keep myself from getting it too far ahead of the other pages, but it's hard one to tell myself to stop because I just <laughs> want to keep writing. I could make a whole website about T-Rex and even and an even bigger one about Tyrannosaurus in general, but generally speaking, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> so within Tyrannosauridae, I suppose, do you have like all of the dinosaurs in there? I have a decent portion of them. The first one I added after Tyrannosaurus Rex was Guanlong because I felt it was a good example of just how diverse the group actually was. So I added Guanlong and then so on and so forth beyond that. And things like Displetosaurus, Eutyrannus, the now defunct more or less Nanotyrannus and also Raptor Rex, kind of like Nanotyrannus, should probably just lump that in with Tarbosaurus with a footnote that they might still be different. But yeah, I got the Tyrannosaur group on the pa- on the site is the one with the most species listed. I don't have every Tyrannosaur on there or Tyrannosauroid, I guess I should say. But it's definitely the one with the largest list of species listed. <laughs> nice. What was it about Guanlong that you like so much? I just remember when that first came out and I was I was just a kid whenever it came out. I, I say that as if I'm an old man now, but regardless. <laughs> and it came out and just seeing these pictures of this feathery, big crested, three fingered, dog sized cousin of T Rex <laughs> just caught my attention. And it just seemed so out of the ordinary and so unlike anything I would have expected. And I thought back to that when I was creating the site and I realized okay, so I have T Rex on there. What's the next Tyrannosaur? probably should do Guang Long because if it caught, you know, it's a good one to catch people's attention and, and help them realize that the group as a whole is far more diverse than just big headed, short armed, two fingered bro- bone crushers. And that there's these, you know, fast moving, almost entirely feathery, you know, early dinosaurs that look more like a velociraptor than a T-Rex. And I think it's a good way to know introduce people into the the whole family really it's there's t-rex and then it's there's its crazy cousins (laughs) yeah 
Was Guanlong, I always think of you, Tyrannus, as this, the oddball because of its featheriness. Was Guanlong found with feathers as well? I don't believe it was found with direct evidence of feathers, but I, I'm pretty sure it was found around the same time as D-Long, which is a little mm. bit smaller. But it was found with direct evidence of feathers, so it was kind of inferred that it was at the time when they it was kind of assumed that maybe the small primitive Tyrannosaurs were feathery, whereas the mm. big, more advanced Tyrannosaurs like Despolitosaurus and T-Rex were scaly. And then you, Tyrannus, completely flipped that upside down as well because it proved <laughs> that you could be big and still be feathery. But it was kind yeah. of at the time just inferred that Guanlong was feathery. And I think that's pretty much the, the generally accepted consensus these days still. Yeah, that's a good point because if you have other small theropods that are largely feathered and then you have a larger member of the same group like you, Tyrannus, that's feathered, obviously the safe assumption at least which often is problematic in paleontology but you would assume that guadlog would be feathered being in between sized and a tyrannosaur yeah there's really nothing saying that it wouldn't be it's not like there's extensive skin impressions that show nothing but scales on guadlog based on its closest relatives it would be safer to assume it had feathers it would be like discovering a new dromaeosaur and depicting it scaly despite the fact that Dromaeosaurs are pretty much exclusively, as far as anyone can tell, feathered. <laughs> mm -hmm. Since you follow T Rex so much, I want to ask you about a couple of the controversial topics because even though like we don't research dinosaurs, sometimes that can be helpful because if you're researching them, a lot of times you'll end up with a dog in the fight of, you know, mm -hmm. I think that they're feathered and I've published all these papers about how they're feathered and things like that. But do you have a preference or do you have what uh, a preferred view in terms of what you think is more likely in terms of feathers on t-rex i would say it's almost certainly fact that tyrannosaurus rex had feathers in some capacity i'm not sure i would fully buy into the super fluffy chicken-esque <laughs> look although i would say that's probably likely with the juveniles especially hatchlings, you know, when they're small and needing to stay warm growing up and continuing to be more or less feathered. And then T-Rex goes through arguably the most intense growth spurt of any animal that I've ever seen. And in that time frame, when it bulked up, probably lost the majority of its feathers. Although, I, because there is there are st some scale impressions of T-Rex, I believe, portions of like the foot and the tail that showed that there was at least some exposed scales. Mm -hmm. The adults probably had, of course, this is all <laughs> just based off of my not so professional opinion and what I've seen and what I've read, but the adults probably had some feathers. I kind of imagine, you know, display structures, you know, bright feathers on the males, maybe something I like to compare them maybe to a red tail hawk where, you know, you got some darker, more drab colors for camouflage, but especially in the males, maybe flashes of color, like some deep, some, some off, like rusty reds or, or blues or whatever they may have had along the, maybe the crests and the, the arms, the tails, something along that or along the spines, but then the majority of the body being largely scaly. So I guess I'll ask about the other T-Rex controversy while we're at it, which I think the biggest one would be lips. Do you have a, any thoughts about T-Rex lips? It's funny that came up you know, recently is such a hot topic. And I realized when I was reading all these articles and papers, I had all these images of T-Rex with its teeth sticking out, but I had almost as many images of it and other dinosaurs with lips. And I never really put two and two together that <laughs> it could be one or the other, or, you know, mostly lipped with the teeth, just the tips sticking out. However, you know, the depiction or the theory would go. But after it came out, I thought about it and I realized, I mean, it makes sense that a T-Rex would have at least something in the term in terms of lips and that, you know, its teeth probably they would have had to stay moist. That's a that's something I read that, you know, most animals, they got to keep their teeth like that. And the reason crocodilians don't is because they're living in the water, well, mm -hmm. or more or less in the water. So, you know, maybe Spinosaurus didn't need to, didn't really need lips and hunting fish, it may have gotten in the way. But predators these days, including reptiles and then mammals, which are a little bit of a poor analogy, but sometimes they add up still, uh, they get by just fine with having lips. So I don't see any reason why 
T-Rex couldn't have had lips. Maybe I don't think you're wrong to depict them without them. Kind of like it wouldn't be wrong to depict a T-Rex with mostly scales or mostly feathers. But I would probably, the, the image I use on my site has, has lips. So I guess you could say I'm, <laughs> I'm more or less in the lip category. Yeah. T-Rex gave a lot of lip. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Is there any other topics about T-Rex that you've been thinking about a lot lately? Well, the two that I feel like, like everyone more or less feels the same way about them, although you still get the, a couple of people who try to argue otherwise. Like I was saying earlier, Nano Tyrannus, probably a young T-Rex. I don't see very many, unless, you know, the dueling dinosaurs reveal something crazy about these young Nano Tyrannus T-Rex creatures that is completely un-T-Rex like. Everything about the growth curves and, you know, the physical attributes of Nano Tyrannus just screams young T-Rex. I feel like the theories on the reason why we don't see a medium-sized predator is because young T-Rexes were essentially being that medium-sized predator makes a lot of sense when you look at the young, you know, specimens like Jane or the one of the dueling dinosaurs. So I don't see any reason why we shouldn't just keep going with the theory that Nano Tyrannus doesn't exist. Uh, I know a lot of people thought it was cool um, that happens. (laughs) It's not about what's cool. It's about what's accurate. Yeah. And if you want a Nano Tyrannus, really Guanlong, like you were saying, it's more Nano than Nano Tyrannus. Just go with that guy. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> lots of medium sized, you know, fast moving, likely fast moving Tyrannosaurus out there that you know can fill that role for you. I mean, it doesn't have to be Nano Tyrannus. Like, yeah, Guanlong or Electrosaurus. There's there's dozens of Tyrannosaurids, and there's plenty in that same size and category and same build that would fill that need just fine. <laughs> hmm. And T-Rex was probably a hunter that was also a scavenger. I don't know why that seems to still be going on these days, but... (laughs) Yeah. Before recording this, you sent me some videos because you were just at the Carnegie Museum, which Mm -hmm. is awesome. And I appreciate (laughs) it because we haven't been able to go to any museums this year. So being able to live vicariously and see some museums through you is great. Um, (laughs) I didn't realize that the Carnegie Museum is so... I don't know. I don't want to be insulting to other old museums, but like modern looking, everything's sort of in a more tableau sort of setting with like plants around it. And it, it looks much more like a modern museum than I expected for one of the oldest dinosaur museums. I was expecting something AM and H like where it's very, you know, clean and, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's like the mount is there and you can look at it from the sides and there's not a lot else going on around it. Yeah. It was like that for a long time. You know, I think it was up and through the early 2000s. It was more of that line them up and look at them kind of setup where the, you know, the T-Rex was kangaroo posed. You know, (laughs) the Allosaurus was kangaroo posed. It was all just that classic older, you know, 1900s style. And then in the And I actually went there when I was really little and it was still like that. That's why I know it must have still been in the early 2000s that it was like that. But sometime, I can't remember the exact year, but sometime in the mid 2000s, they did a complete renovation of the dinosaurs in their time exhibit and make it make them look like they're in a natural environment, bring out some more accurate you know, depictions of this, of the skeletons, um, just really totally revamp it. So yes, from the outside, it still looks like that you know, AMNH or Chicago Field Museum, you know, very old architecturally looking building. And then you go inside and it's just completely modernized. I mean, they, they kept a lot of like some of the older style architecture and designs inside with the grand staircase, even the elevators and the water fountains are gorgeous in a lot of the museum. But then where science is essentially taking place, they really modernized it, which is fantastic because it really helps because museums are where the public get a lot of their first impressions of dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. And that I feel like that's incredibly important to really showcase them more as living animals than just bones in a, in a room. While we were there, you know, my wife and I were actually talking about this, where it really it's really different when you imagine them as a living animal rather than just bones on display. It really changes yeah. your your perspective, your perspective on dinosaurs. Yeah, for sure. And it's, I was partly what struck me was you one of the videos you showed me, you're going through the T-Rex area and you get to the holotype and it's posed 
like in such a dynamic way it's like you said not just in that kangaroo pose or like at am and h where it's just this t-rex in isolation where everyone can walk around it's so much more a part of its environment than you tend to see anywhere else i guess the natural history museum at the smithsonian in washington dc has Mm -hmm. recently also gone that way maybe even more so with it attacking a triceratops (laughs) but Yeah. yeah that's really cool yeah, there's like there's three T Rexes that I think of in these dynamic poses, and they're all of different levels. There's the one that, which is a cast of the one at the AMNH in Denver, where I'm sure a lot of people have seen pictures of it, where it looks like it's dancing. And I know what they were going for when they originally displayed it that way because it it was supposed to be dynamic, but it kind of comes out looking a little silly. But I kind of like it in a way. <laughs> then there's the one, then there's the holotype at the Carnegie, which. I feel like a lot of people have actually seen without realizing it because it's the picture you see on Wikipedia when you look up Tyrannosaurus Rex in that kind of more normal, I guess you could say, but still dynamic pose where it's crouching over its over its food and defending it against another Tyrannosaur. And then, yes, now we have the even more dynamic but not quite dancing level T-Rex at, in the Smithsonian, which I have yet to see, but I am looking forward to seeing soon enough. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's kind of over a rib cage, right? The one of the Carnegie. Is that what it's eating? Yes, they have uh, essentially the rib cage and it's a little hard to see. I probably didn't quite capture it in the uh, video. Uh, there's also a skull of an Edmontosaurus. So essentially a half eaten Edmontosaurus is what they're fighting over. Um, oh. It was nicknamed Dead Ed because for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, you have CM9380, which is the holotype which is the more robust of the two tyrannosaurs on display, and then a cast of Pex Rex um, from Fort Peck out in Montana, which you, oh, see nice. a lot, which you see a lot of them. I feel like up there with Stan and AMNH5027, there's a lot of casts of him, him, her, um, <laughs> it, you know, around the country, but that's who they have it facing off against. And it's kind of nice that you have the two morphs. You know, there's a lot of debate as to what that means, but, you know, you have the holotype, which is a much more robust individual Versus something that's the morph that's a lot more gracile. So you can really compare the two looks of Tyrannosaurus Rex side by side, which is kind of nice. Yeah, that's cool. That reminds me a little bit of the LA Natural History Museum has a growth series. I don't remember the museum numbers like you do, though. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I, know a, them down. I know a few numbers, but then the other ones, I just go by their nicknames. Like that, I, I believe that one's Thomas, I think is its nickname, is the big one. <laughs> yeah. So with the, uh, you mentioned the sort of dancing look of the T-Rex at Denver. I've never been to that museum, so I, and I can't picture it in my head. What sort of, what's it up to? So it's, it's posed in a way where it's balancing on one foot. The other foot is kicking out, and it looks like it's, you know, the idea is I think it's supposed to be, you know, lunging out with its claws and its teeth all at once in this very dynamic, terrifying attitude. But it ends up balancing on its foot with its tail kind of behind it it's almost vertical the entire skeleton you know t-rex is only about 10 to 13 feet tall at the hips because and that's pretty much its height because they walk horizontally but because of the way it's set up the head is probably 20 or more feet well 20 or more because of the stand it's standing on but you know skeleton wise 20 feet in the air which is kind of like when you see an old book about dinosaurs where it says t-rex is 20 feet tall that's kind of what they mean is standing straight up and it was just standing straight up its arms are kind of like out to the sides and its head is just kind of like looking over its shoulder as it's balancing on one foot and it's very dynamic don't get me wrong but the idea of a 16,000 pound Tyrannosaurus Rex balancing on one foot while standing almost vertically seems a little off. (laughs) Seems very risky for an animal that big when we know how much damage they sustain when they fall down. Yeah, there's a lot of gravity working against it in this scenario. And I kind of call it the jazz hands T-Rex because it looks like it's (laughs) doing jazz hands. (laughs) <laughs> that's a good name i also like the you were calling them kangaroo mounts before which i think is pretty fantastic with the broken tail and the too upright posture yeah that, when you look back at those at photos of skeletons mounted that way you can't help but think to yourself that wow that does look uncomfortable <laughs> now that you yeah. think about it yeah when you know how the vertebrae you know just in general how vertebrae sort of connect to each other and you see two that are making a 90 degree angle you're like, oh, like, wait. don't do that. <laughs> it, it hurts looking at it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So is there anything else that you'd like to share? 
I could go on and on. And I know you're going to have to, <laughs> there's only so much you can put in the, in the podcast. So I'm trying not to go too crazy here, but you know how it is when you start talking about dinosaurs, you can't stop. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for anybody who's in Pennsylvania or in the PA area, besides checking out the Carnegie and also the Harrisburg State Museum, it's very understated. But that's a good little museum, too. There's a site north of Harrisburg near a town called Danville. And I'm hoping I'm not going to send a bunch of people swarming into this place. But (laughs) there is a there's a site there called the Montour Fossil Pit. And it's at a public park. And it's a Devonian age fossil pit. It used to be a quarry, I believe. And now you can go in and the public can go in and collect fossils. It's mainly, you know, things like shells. You get the occasional trilobite or other kinds of, you know, prehistoric shelled uh, creatures. But it's a great little site to go fossil hunting just for like, you know, a morning or an afternoon. And it's not that hard to get to. It's a little bit out there in the middle of, you know, farmland and PA. But, you know, it's a good site to go fossil hunting for for the casual, you know, paleontology fan. (laughs) Cool. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in that. Yeah. And then you're only about an hour or so north of Harrisburg, I think. So you can go hit up the State Museum and see a mastodon that was found in PA, see some other, you know, Triassic reptiles that would have been native to the area. They have some other stuff like a T-Rex skull replica, which isn't super accurate for the area, but it's always nice to see a T-Rex skull. But it's a good little museum. I always recommend that because it gets overlooked uh, between the Carnegie on one end of the state and Drexel in Philly at the other. This one in the middle really gets overlooked. Nice. I've been, I should have had that to our dinosaur museum map. I don't think I have it on there. If you're in the state, you may as well hit it up. <laughs> yeah. And and the other end of the spectrum, there's also one in Morgantown, West Virginia. So if you're near Pittsburgh, it's also not that far just to go down into Morgantown. There's a little geological survey museum. They have the only ma- real mounted dinosaur in the state of West Virginia. There's an, I think it's about a 60% complete Edmontosaurus that was found out west, and they brought it back and mounted it at the geological survey. And they have a lot of dinosaur fossil replicas too. But yeah, that's the only spot in West Virginia where you can see a real dinosaur skeleton. Nice. And I think I'll cut it there before I go too far. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Is there anywhere people should go to follow your work besides everything dinosaurs.weebly.com? Well, I'll, I'll do us both a favor and I'll plug you guys in your own podcast. But honestly, Besides the website, the most pl- the place I'm most active at right now is the the Discord for the patrons for I Know Dino or any of my posts that, uh, or little articles that you guys post on the website. So if, if you want anything beyond the, my website, the you know I Know Dino podcast and website and Discord, if you decide to become a patron, that's where you can find you can find me there too. If you might even find me in person if I'm at you know if you're going to the Carnegie, you know hopefully I'll get back there soon to volunteer, but. I would say that's those are probably the best places. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for the plug too. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So thank you again so much for coming on. We'll have to have you on before another six years pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to even just to talk casually about dinosaurs. I'm always up for that. <laughs> awesome. Well, th- thanks again so much. Not a problem. Happy to be here. Thanks again for the interview, Taylor. Uh, Unfortunately, I couldn't make it to this interview, but I've been enjoying your posts on Discord and, of course, on your website. And now on to our Dinosaur of the Day, Xenoceratops, which was a request from Elrex via our Patreon and Discord. Speaking of Discord, so thanks. Xenoceratops was a centrosaurine ceratopsid that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Alberta, Canada, in the foremost formation. And it was an herbivore. It probably had a parrot-like or turtle-like beak. It's estimated to be about 20 feet or 6 meters long, but it's hard to know for sure based on the fossils that have been found so far, and it weighed about 2 tons. Xenoceratops had a large frill, and it had two thick knobs that projected out of the middle of the frill on the top. Hmm, sort of like Diablo Ceratops or something? Sort of. Like it's got the two kind of horns coming out, but then there's also these knobby things just below it. And there's no bumps or other ornamentation in the midline of the frill. And brow horns, it's probable that it had those, and nasal horns like other centrosaurines. It's possible that the brow horns were large, and that's based on a specimen housed at the Royal Tyrol that hasn't been officially described, but possibly belongs to Xenoceratops. So Xenoceratops probably had this long, low nasal bone similar to Medusaceratops, and that's based on the fragment that's been found. 
the type and only species is Xenoceratops formostensis. The fossils were found in 1958 by Juan Langsing Jr., who found skull fragments near Foremost, Alberta, Canada, and they were found in a bone bed. It was described as a low-diversity bone bed. The fragments are stored at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa, and then in 2003, David Evans and Michael Ryan started looking at these fossils. They saw one was a spike, the other an unusually large socket, so they analyzed them more thoroughly in 2009. And then Michael Ryan, Dave Evans, and Kieran Shepard described Xenoceratops in 2012. There's not many dinosaurs known from the formation. It's mostly teeth and some hadrosaur skeletons and also pachycephalosaurid colopeocephaly. I don't think we've talked about that one before. No. In 2012, when Xenoceratops was named, it was the oldest known ceratopsid from Canada, and it's the first ceratopsian described from the foremost formation. So the genus name means alien horned face. (laughs) That's a good one. And it's because it refers to the lack of ceratopsians known from the foremost formation, not because it had a particularly weird looking face. That makes sense. And then the species name is in honor of the town foremost in Alberta, Canada. The holotype is a partial parietal, so the side of the skull. And other skull bones, including horn and frill material, have been found from at least three adult individuals. And then there's the fragmentary skull at the Royal Tyrrell Museum that may be Xenoceratops. Specimens included, according to the authors, quote, hundreds of unidentifiable small fragments. And identifiable pieces are usually larger than 20 millimeters. So you can imagine how small these fragments are. Somebody's got a real puzzle to put back together. Mm Mm-hmm. Xenoceratops was thought to be a centrosaurine because of the squamosal. Centrosaurines had large nasal horns and ornamental frills. But not many identifiable fossil material has been found in the foremost formation because of the limited amount of exposure. But based on microvertebrate localities and known dinosaurs in the area, the dinosaurs in foremost formation were probably similar to those in the Oldman and Dinosaur Park formations, but more basal. So Michael Ryan said the discovery of Xenoceratops shows how much more there is to learn about the origins of ceratopsids. It's possible that the size of the horns were for recognition and to maybe attract mates. Michael Ryan said in an EarthSky article, quote, Xenoceratops shows us that even the geologically oldest ceratopsids had massive spikes on their head shields and that their cranial ornamentation would only become more elaborate as new species evolved, end quote. So Michael Ryan and Dave Evans are leading the Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project to learn more about late Cretaceous dinosaurs and how they evolved. And I feel like Michael Ryan's name comes up a lot lately when we're talking about ceratopsins. He's named a lot of ceratopsins. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Anyway, you can see Xenoceratops on a silver coin made by the Royal Canadian Mint. It's currently not available to buy, but it looks really cool. Yeah, it probably came out a decade or so ago around the time when it was named. 2016 it came out. Oh, really? That is actually kind of recent. Mm-hmm. I don't think we got that one. No. Were you looking into getting it? Is that how you know it's not available? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. It was 2014. So it was a little before we started the podcast and knew to look for these things. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And I've been looking forward to this fun fact yeah. all day. Garrett was laughing hysterically to himself. And then I asked, <laughs> what's going on? And he said, you'll find out. It is wonderful. So <laughs> first of all, it's about cloacas again. Because there's so much. I actually discovered this little tidbit while posting last week. I was checking spellings of things and whatever. And I realized this needed to be a fun fact. So it's kind of a week late, but it's great. First of all, I should say the generally accepted plural of cloaca is cloace or cloake. Oh, not cloacas. Yeah. But I, I mean, like I said, there was a peer reviewed article that had that in the title. So. I'm okay with the fact that I said it because a group of scientists apparently approved it. But in any event, we said last week that cloacee were limited to excreting and mating functions and not things like eating and breathing. But as always, there are exceptions, and there's at least one animal that can breathe through its cloaca. Well, since you mentioned at the top of the show something about turtles. (laughs) Yes. But why? It's wonderful. So some turtles, they can breathe through their cloaca. 
It's technically a form of cutaneous respiration, and cutaneous respiration is when you're breathing through your skin or other non-gill slash lung membranes. Frogs are really famous for breathing through their skin in this a similar sort of cutaneous respiration, and it's one of the reasons why you need to wash your hands before touching a frog, because the oil on your hands can interfere with their breathing. However, frogs also have lungs and can breathe through their internal mouth's skin, too. So they have technically three different ways of breathing. Their entire body is just made for breathing. Pretty much, yeah. And as a side note, you also need to wash your hands after touching frogs because they are covered in salmonella. Hmm. So just that's generally true for all reptiles. I mean, we're familiar with it with chickens, which reptiles are paraphyletic, so chickens aren't usually considered reptiles. But anyway, anything in that whole family, wash your hands. (laughs) also some sea snakes have an ability to breathe through their skin but apparently not enough for all of their oxygen needs it's about enough for like a third but obviously if you're underwater and you can breathe a little bit it's really helpful you could dive deeper and all sorts of stuff like that Mm -hmm. now turtles are more heavily armored they have that super weird condition that no other animal on earth has where literally their rib cage has grown to the exterior of their body. Their shell is literally their ribs, which is why you can't pull a turtle out of their shell because their shell is their ribs. Mm -hmm. They can also feel when you touch the shell. Yes. They're very sensitive to it, right? Yeah. And their, their whole body is inside their rib cage. So their hips are technically inside their rib cage, which is super weird. No other animals like that. It actually makes breathing really difficult for turtles, though, because the way we breathe, obviously, we move our diaphragm and we only have to exert force when we're breathing in. I'm pretty sure that's the way it works. And then when you breathe out, it naturally just sort of rebounds. I might have that backwards. Mm. But in any event, it's the sort of we only have to put effort in one way. With turtles, they have to put in effort for breathing in and breathing out. Because they, since they're rigid on the outside, their lungs are just sort of like mush inside with the rest of their mush. Mm. They have to push up against their lungs in order to breathe out. And then they have to sort of pull against them in order to breathe in. Is this why they're murderous? Because they're jealous of how other animals breathe? I don't think that's related to it. No. Well, we don't know what turtles (laughs) think. I think they're just hungry. Mm. So... They already have kind of an unusual way of breathing because of that. But what they can also do is with their cloaca, they can contract the muscles in the cloaca and draw water into it, which is similar to the way that they breathe in through their mouth. I mean, it's another fluid. Air is a fluid. Water is a fluid. So maybe this is related to why they can do this. And when they breathe in the water for lack of a better word, it goes into a pair of large pouches that are connected to the cloaca, which are technically called bursae. And the bursae are full of vaguely gill-like structures Hmm. that are capable of transporting oxygen out of the water and into their bloodstream. So yeah, they basically have a small set of lungs attached to their cloaca for breathing water. That's really weird. Yes. One specific example is fantastic, and this is the one that made me burst out laughing. So it's called the Fitzroy River Turtle. It's from Queensland, Australia, mm-hmm. and it so lives... it's got a nickname. Yes, it, in fact, it does. Uh, <laughs> it's called the Bum-Breathing Turtle. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, it's wonderful. And presumably the reason that it can breathe through its cloaca so effectively is because it lives in highly oxygenated rapids. Mm. So when water is sloshing around in the rapids, it absorbs a little bit more oxygen. And then, you know, it's just ripe for the cloacal breathing at that point. The best part of this that I found was a quote that adults of both sexes swam with a widely gaping cloacal orifice up to 30 millimeters, which is over an inch in diameter. Something about the word gaping there. <laughs> gaping cloaca, yeah. The entire shell is only about 260 millimeters long, which means it's like a tenth of the length of a shell is how big it opens its cloaca. And apparently it keeps its cloaca open a lot of the time when it's out of the water too. Huh. So it's just used to having it open all the time. It looks round, by the way, because we were talking about all the shapes. Yeah. <laughs> there was all these 
great quotes about the researchers who discovered this and how excited they were about it and how when the light hit it the right way they could see like a hundred millimeters into it and how like breathtaking it was and all this kind of stuff <laughs> it's just the funniest thing the gaping cloacal orifice yeah do you know if it having it open all the time does that is that a problem at all like, could well, things you don't want going in there get in there? I don't know. They didn't, I couldn't find anything about that. I didn't specifically search for what goes into <laughs> this <It's fair>. cloaca. <laughs> but yeah, you would presume that that could be a problem if it's open. It's like, but I mean, I guess that happens in our mouth too. Yeah. Because our trachea is open and our mouth is open most of the time. So it's probably fine. I guess being in rapids, it's okay. Yeah. I, with fish, they get all sorts of parasites on their gills mm. so it's probably the same sort of thing they can probably get parasites that go into their bursae and live in there as well but i wouldn't think it'd be any different than a fish getting them on their gills or something hopefully their immune system can take care of it mm. so a couple more fun facts about this they can pump water in and out as fast as every second wow and they still apparently need lungs but the cloacal respiration can account for up to two-thirds of their oxygen needs that's way more than a sea snake. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And as a result, they can stay underwater for up to three weeks straight. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing. Part of that is because they have a much lower respiration rate than a lot of animals do. So they don't need a ton of oxygen. And on top of that, turtles just have amazing anaerobic abilities. And just in general, turtles can survive up to 33 hours without any oxygen at all. Wow. In a purely nitrogen environment, in other words. Hmm. So, yeah, turtles are amazing. I had no idea they had this crazy ability to just not need oxygen or to breathe oxygen through their cloaca. Just astonishing. <laughs> As a, a, a further offshoot of this rabbit hole, mammals also have the ability to metabolize a little bit of oxygen without the use of lungs. Is it similar to the turtle? It is not. No, okay. it does not go through our... Bum hole? Yeah. <laughs> In the case of bats, they can expel about 10% of the carbon dioxide they produce through their wing skin. It's obviously a very large oh. surface area. Mm-hmm. But most other mammals can't really absorb much oxygen or release much carbon dioxide through cutaneous respiration. However, there are a couple important exceptions. Some cells in mammals do get their oxygen directly from the air. Hmm. So it's kind of important to think about this in terms of like why our cells are getting oxygen. So our breathing is just the most convenient way to get oxygen into the individual cells in our bodies that use them for all the purposes that cells need oxygen because we're just a big lump of cells after all but it's hard to get blood to a couple specific areas of the body and in those cases you can get it directly from the air basically so the surface of your skin is obviously in contact with the air and the only connection to blood can be through like really tiny capillaries so apparently about the outer half a millimeter of our skin all those cells get their oxygen directly from the air. Hmm. So they just get their respiration. They just do it basically on the surface of your skin. They don't need the blood cells to make it to them through the lungs and the whole circulatory system. Why bother? Interesting. Right? They're in contact with the air. Why not just breathe the air? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But again, that's only the outermost half a millimeter. It's not even all the skin. It's just like the outermost of the outermost layer of skin that hmm. does it. The other really cool place that uses oxygen directly from the air is the front of our eyes. Eyes can't have blood in them because it would block the light. So what most of your eyeball does is it interacts with the blood. It gets the oxygen from the blood and then it transfers it into a humor. It's called like the old word, the humor into the inside of the eye, which is a clear fluid that carries the oxygen. Mm -hmm. But on the outside of the eye, even getting the blood vessels there and connecting would be too difficult, presumably. Plus, your eyes are always in contact with the air, right? Is this why they say take out your contacts at night? It could be. That's actually a really good point. It's, it's probably why soft contacts are a little bit more comfortable. I've heard people talk about how they're more porous and that allows your eyes to behave more naturally. Hmm. 
So in the case of the front of our eyes, the way it works is that the outside of the cornea, which is the part that's in contact with the air, directly absorbs oxygen from the air and it transfers it into the clear aqueous humor. That's different than the humor that's like in the middle of the eye. This one's in between the lens and the cornea. There's Mm. this little fluid filled area there. Totally different types of jokes over there. (laughs) I didn't even get that. (laughs) (laughs) Different kind of humor. Mm -hmm. And then that aqueous humor transfers the oxygen to the backside of the cornea because it can't even go through the full thickness of the cornea. It has to use this fancy technique. But in that way, our eyes actually kind of breathe. The cells on the surface of our eyes, I should say, sort of breathe on their own. They don't need to go through the lungs and all the way up into the head and through the whole process there. Hmm. But again, with us, it only works on the very outermost edge of the cells because we don't have any fancy membranes that can bring in tons of oxygen. Our bodies basically prioritize keeping everything out as much as possible. Our skin is like a really tough membrane to get through. Basically, a little bit of oxygen and some water is all it's intended to let through. Yep. And it tries to keep out everything else as much as possible. For some reason, that brought to mind, uh, do you remember Kablam? Yeah. In the 90s. Inside Out Boy? I don't remember Inside Out Boy. He was swinging. He, got, he swung really high one time and he turned his skin inside out. And I think he had a lot of problems. I don't remember exactly what he did. But. That would cause problems yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the moral of the story is turtles can breathe through their cloaca. Only a few turtles, I should emphasize. Mm. There are very few that can actually pull this move off. But some of them are amazing at it. And they can survive 33 hours without oxygen, three weeks underwater. Watch out for them. They can really sneak up on you. Yep. It also proves that every time... I say something always is the case or that animals never do something. It's always wrong. There's always an animal that Mm -hmm. does the weird thing that you wouldn't think they could do because it's just just how life is. There's so many animals. Yeah. We don't even know all the animals. Mm -hmm. And so many millions of years of evolution of just random weird stuff happening. It's bound to happen sooner or later. And on that note, that wraps up this episode of Vino Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our growing community, patreon.com slash inodino. Thanks again, and until next time. You could tell from watching me walk on my dinosaur.